All right, we are jumping into uh, the final chapter of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. We started this journey back in the month of February. It's been a couple months now. We've been picking our way through the book of 1 Peter, which was written, of course, by the Apostle Peter, written to the church that was suffering, suffering persecution under the hands of Nero. And much like when you close out a letter, you say some of the most important things that you want to remind people of at the end of your letter, that is what Peter is doing as he closes out this this epistle, this letter to the scattered, persecuted church. He is writing this letter, firstly to the leaders, he's closing the letter, with some thoughts for the leaders, some lessons for the leaders, and then some commands for the congregation. So in the middle of trial, in the middle of persecution, he wants them to remember these things and to put them into practice. Because even though suffering and persecution is what the church is facing, they remain hopeful and they are to occupy, as Jesus said, this world until he comes again. And so these these leader lessons are where we're going to start with as we look at verse 1. Let's jump right in. Peter says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Interesting how he starts out. Peter starts out saying, hey, listen, I am appealing to you not as the chief apostle, not as the one with the most authority in the church, because he was, remember, Peter was in Jesus' inner circle. Jesus, his 12 apostles, he had three that he was really tight with, and that was Peter, James, and John. And Peter always was the chief one. His name is always listed first when the apostles are mentioned. He is the one who preached on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was born, and 3,000 souls got saved. He's the one who went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and literally saw Jesus in his glory. Glory, I mean, light, brilliant light all around him. And he heard God the Father say, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. I mean, he saw Moses and Elijah in this Mount of Transfiguration. Peter is the man. He's also the one who was prone to put his foot in his mouth. Remember, for example, when Jesus uh, was taken In the Garden of Gethsemane, and he went through those illegal trials just prior to his Passion Week and his crucifixion after his Passion Week had begun after Palm Sunday, just prior to his crucifixion. Peter's out warming himself by the fire as Jesus is in front of Caiaphas, and a servant girl comes to him and says, "Ah, you're with Jesus, aren't you? And he says, I don't know him. Someone else, you were with Jesus. You have his accent. Nah, I saw you with him. Nope. And he begins to curse. Three times he denies Christ, that he knows him. Throw in the F-bomb, or I don't know what it, what it cursing was to them, but he was a fisherman, so I'm sure he had a pretty good vocabulary when it came to cursing. Cursing, he, he is that one who would stick his foot in his mouth, but also who is very bold. I mean, nobody else got out of the boat and walked on the water, but Jesus and Peter. So Peter here is appealing in a spirit of humility to the leaders of the church. And by the way, elder, bishop, overseer, pastor, these terms are used interchangeably in the New Testament to talk about spiritual leadership in the church. And so Peter is appealing not as the apostle, not as the great preacher, not as the leader of the others. He is appealing as a fellow elder, a fellow leader in the church. And here's what he's saying. I witnessed Christ's sufferings with my own eyes. I saw it. And he knows that his own suffering is coming soon. He said, I, I've seen the sufferings of Christ. I know what it is to have Jesus model what it's like to be a leader for his people. And by the way, servant leadership was really um, modeled First, as far as I can understand, in history, by Jesus. You see, prior to Christ and this idea of what it means to be a servant leader, what we see is we see big kings, monarchs, and the little people serving them. 
We kind of have that model in corporate America sometimes, you know? You got the big CEO, and then you get all the little peons doing what he says. That's how kings work, right? The king is in control, owns a bunch of the land. You pay taxes to make the king and his family's life better. But Jesus said, this, this isn't how the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God is like, it's, it's not top down, it's bottom up. And he said, if you want to be great, then be a servant of all. The greatest in the kingdom are the servants of all. And Jesus began to model this. The way to have, husbands, I'm talking to you now, just real quickly. The way to have a good family, a strong marriage, is to, to embody this same principle as a leader, to be a servant leader. I am here to make my family better. You're not here just to serve me and get my slippers and fetch the paper or my iPhone. <laughs> we don't have papers anymore, do we? Not much. No, you're here to model what it looks like, what love looks like, what leadership looks like. Leadership in the kingdom looks like serving. And Peter's saying, listen, I'm a fellow elder. I'm not pulling rank on you here. I'm a fellow elder. I'm appealing to you by the sufferings of Christ as a witness of this. And by the way, the glory that's going to be revealed as a result of this. But here's the lesson I want you to hear and to, I'm passing on to you. He starts out by saying this, be shepherds of God's flock. The people belong to God. And you're a shepherd. Be a shepherd of God's flock that is under your care watching over them. And here is Christian leadership. The heart of it is this. The heart of serving Jesus is serving his people. Caring for his people. That same Peter who three times denied Jesus, three times said, I don't know him, cursed him. Interestingly, after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, when he came back for about 40 days and taught about the kingdom of God before his ascension, he's on the seashore, Jesus, and he's cooking some fish on a campfire. Peter has gotten discouraged because he thought Christ was coming to set up his kingdom now, and he's, Jesus is on the big throne. He's going to be on the, one of the little thrones on his right hand, and the earthly kingdom, the, the messianic kingdom is starting now. It doesn't happen. The plan is blown up, and, and Peter returns to what he was familiar with, fishing. Not for men. Remember when Jesus called Peter, he was a blue-collar fisherman fishing for men, and now, discouraged, by the way things have happened, he said this, I'm going fishing again. And he did, goes fishing. He's out on the boat. The last three and a half years have been a blur. He's seen so many miracles. He's heard the teaching of the Messiah. But things didn't pan out the way he expected and his leader's dead. Oh yeah, the tomb was empty. He thinks he's alive, but he, he's going back fishing. And then he sees, someone says, that's the Lord on the shore cooking those fish. And he dives in the water with clothes and all. <laughs> that's just Peter. Gets to the shore, dripping, sopping wet. And around that campfire, this is John 21, verses 15 to 17. Jump down to that scripture if you would. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these other apostles? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. What did Jesus say? If you love me, feed my lambs. What's a lamb? It's a baby sheep. Aren't they cute? They are so cute and pretty stupid. And he said, if you love me, you're going to make sure they eat. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. You know, we show the Lord we love him by taking care of people. Because people matter to God. 
And because of, they matter to God, they, they matter to us. Three times Peter denies Jesus. Three times Jesus gives Peter an opportunity to say that he loves him. And the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. If God has given you uh, leadership, family, leadership at work, leadership on a team, leadership in a ministry, one of the ways you show Jesus you love him is to take care of people. Just take care of them. Be more concerned about them than the job getting done. Does the job have to get done? Yes, it does. But in the middle of the job getting done, in the middle of accomplishing the goal, don't forget about the people. Take care of the people. That's what the kingdom looks like. Shepherd God's flock. Watch over them. Jump back up now to verse 2 as we look more at, at these lessons. So shepherd God's flock. Take, take care of the people. Peter now understands this. He's getting to be an older man. He knows his death is imminent under this persecution. And he's remembering the words of Jesus. You love me? You love Jesus? Take care of the people. But here's how you are to take care of them. Not because you have to, but because you are willing. You want to. As God wants you to be. Not, not pursuing dishonest gain, not to benefit yourself, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, appears, he's going to bless you. You're going to receive the crown of glory that's better than the Lombardi trophy. The crown of glory that will never fade away a million years from now. That crown, that reward that God will give to those that take care of his people. It's not going to fade away. So what do we see? What characteristics of good leadership are we seeing here? The first is this. We see with this shepherd's heart of caring for people that we must do this task, not because we have to, but because we want to. It's the willingness that makes the obedience acceptable. Isaiah said the same thing. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. It's not just the obedience. The obedience is good. We need that. But the willingness makes the obedience palatable to God. He, he wants us to want to. Can I be honest? When I was a young man, I did not want to be a pastor. I wanted to be an evangelist. You know what an evangelist does? They travel. I love to travel. I think I got that from my dad. My dad had taken me to Africa, and he's taken me to Europe, and he's taken me to you know, Alaska and the West Coast. And my dad took me all over. He loved to travel and I got that bug, you know. And so I wanted to be a traveling preacher. And I wanted to, this is what an evangelist says, you blow into a place, you blow up by preaching the gospel, you blow out and the pastor takes care of all the problems. (laughs) And so my wife kept telling me when I was a young man and getting out of the financial business into the ministry business, She said, you're a pastor. And I'd say, I rebuke you. Get thee behind me. I'm the next Billy Graham, you know. No, you're not. You're a pastor. Shut up and just do it. She didn't say shut up. Well, maybe. She's she's wonderful. (laughs) She's wonderful. She honestly is. Okay. So anyway, I remember we planted that church in, in Portland, First Rock Church down there, and it didn't go the way... I wanted it to. It was a slow kind of growth. Unlike Bangor, which just exploded. Portland was like, yeah, you know, those people are crazy down there, you know. But I was the crazy one. And I remember battling in my heart, God, I love you. And so I'm going to obey you. But I think you're wrong. (laughs) 
I think I'm supposed to travel. And I could get no peace, and the church was kind of struggling in those days. I'll never forget, I was so in inner turmoil about this need to take care of people. See, it was really, in, in my heart of hearts, probably it was more about me. I want to travel. I want to be known. I want, you know, it was selfish ambition. So I said to Lisa, I can't take this inner turmoil. I've got to have peace. And so what I did is I, I rented a hotel room. I said, I'll see you in a day or two. I grabbed a jug of water and I grabbed my journal because that's been a habit of mine over the years. I'm going to seek God. I've got to get the peace of God in this. And I remember going into that hotel room and saying, God, see, I told you I'm not a pastor. This church is struggling. Pastors are supposed to have, get, gather a flock, not repel them. Let me go. Let me go to the nations. After all, the Great Commission, go. And, you know, you can't argue with God. You can't fight God. Your arms are too short. You can't reach him. You say, what happened? Well, I'm, it was one of these times. I don't, I don't know about you. I've never, to my knowledge, heard the audible voice of God, but I've heard it in here two times in my, my life when it was so loud that I literally was full of fear and started shaking. And this is one of those times. I'm laying on that bed pleading, God, please don't make me be a pastor. Please don't make me. And it reminded me, the scripture came to me where Moses, remember Moses? Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, which is a type of sin, to the promised land, which is a type of the blessing what God has in store for his people. Through that wilderness, he got angry. And what he did was, instead of speaking to the rock for the water to come out, that miracle, he, he just struck it twice in anger. God held that against him because he didn't honor God in the presence of the people. And God said, you're not going into the promised land. I mean, it seems from a human point of view, that just seems like a little thing, all the things he did. And so Moses now, is, his, he's ready to leave this earth. He's old, he's 120. And he goes to God and he says, God, I know I did that. I'm sorry. You know, I've, I've said I was sorry for that. Would you just please let me go to the promised land? And the Lord rebuked him and said, no. And I told you why. And here's what the Bible says. And I don't want you to ask me this again. Scared the, you know, scared him. Don't ask me this again. You know, some of you are trying to maybe get out of a situation you're in. You've been pleading with God, please, God, let this cup pass from me, please, God. And you know what his word says, you, you know, stay where you are. And I heard in my heart, I said, you're a pastor and I don't want to hear this again. And I was shaken, but I got peace. I said, okay, this isn't about me. This is your kingdom. God, I'll do what you want me to do. And if you let me live long, I'll do it for a long time. And I wrote in my journal, I can show it to you today. I am a pastor and I want to do it. And I made a little adjustment in my thinking that day. You know, sometimes all we need to get peace is to make a little adjustment in our thinking. Agree with God, agree with scripture, agree with what you believe is the Lord's will, regardless of what you want or how you feel. And once I made that little adjustment, the first thing, it's amazing, peace comes. You can't buy peace. If you're in turmoil, there's a reason. Find out what that reason is. Go to prayer, find out why am I in turmoil, and find peace. And you can. God leads his children by peace. And then when you, once you understand that, pray for the want to. Okay, God, I know what I'm supposed to do. Now help me to want to do it. And I made that adjustment on the inside and I'm like, okay, I'm going to learn to be a better pastor. I'm going to learn to serve people better. I want to do this. And I jumped in. I went through about a year, year, two years, I can't remember now, of learning leadership, learning how to lead people, how to care for people, not just how to preach or how to travel or how to have a crusade, but you know, how do you love people? How do you lead people in a church? And I began to, I'd go to every conference I could go to. I'd read every book I could. Back in those days, they had tapes before they went to DVD. This is how long ago it was. 
I just began to make the adjustment and get the want to. And you know what's amazing? Once I changed my attitude and just said, I want to do this, God began to send more people. It was amazing. It was remarkable. It was almost overnight. It was like, wow, praise God. I'm going to love these people the best I can. I'm going to feed the word of God. How's your willingness? Leadership lesson. If God has you in a place of leadership, take care of people, not because you have to, but because you want to. Secondly, don't do it to get, out, get from them, not pursuing dishonest gain. Dishonest gain is, it's got a selfish angle. This is for me. I'm your boss, so you can make me look good. I'm your leader, you make me look good. So I can get rich, so I can get known, so I can have my agenda. No, that may happen, but that's not the motive. The motive is, I'm going to help you get better. I'm going to serve you. All the great leaders that we look to and admire have this characteristic. They are there to make other people better not make themselves look good. That's a great coach. A great coach does that. A great president does that. God help us. Great leaders are in it for the benefit of the other people, not so they look good. Jesus modeled this. The Bible says, though he were rich, I mean, he's, he's God. Though he were rich, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. God demonstrated that love for us, that serving us, and that while we were still sinners, while we were not looking for him, not concerned about his glory, his honor, his agenda, his kingdom, but our own, he demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were yet Sinners. Christ whoops, died for us. He was eager to serve us. Thirdly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples. Not pulling the boss card. Not pulling the authority card. Not making you do it because I'm your boss. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time to discipline in the workplace or whatever. But leaders embody this selfless attitude of service that says, I want what's best for you, and I'm not just flapping my gums, I'm living it to show you. You see, a leader who says one thing and lives a different way, that is called hypocrisy. Nobody wants to follow an arrogant leader who's in it for themselves, who doesn't care about you, and who's not living it themselves. But find a leader like Jesus who demonstrated, who really, he, he made the mold on servant leadership, who came not to serve, but to, not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Who cares deeply about our needs. Even when we don't see what we're doing, how we're hurting him, he still cared for us. He still gave himself for us and he lived it. the area of suffering. We suffer. For righteousness, I mean, much of Peter has been about this. But Jesus would not ask us to do anything he was not willing to do. He suffered. He went all the way to the cross and died for us. And by the way, Peter got the message. And I told you this very first week we started First Peter. That just prior to his own death under Nero, he watched his wife be murdered executed, encouraged her just before she was executed. Imagine watching your spouse be executed. And then when it was the time for him to be executed, he, they were going to crucify him. He said, I want to be crucified upside down because I don't deserve to be crucified the same way my Lord was. He got it. It's amazing what God can do in the heart of a person who's willing to live their faith. 
You know, one of the qualifications for leadership in the kingdom of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, is that you have to have your family in order. You have to have a good marriage. Your children have to respect you. And if that doesn't happen, that can be disqualification for leadership. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to follow any leader whose marriage is on the rocks telling me how to live my marriage. <laughs> I mean, you can still go to the Word, thankfully, and, and see the pattern. But I want to follow somebody who's living it. In the air, and, and they're not going to be perfect, but at least what they say and what the Scripture says, they're trying. It's like be examples. Be examples to the flock. Don't lord it over them. And then, let me shift gears here real quickly. He goes to the, to the congregation. There's some leadership lessons. Have that shepherding heart where you care for people, where you embody servant leadership, where you're not in it for yourself. You're serving them because you want to, not because you have to. Not for dishonest gain. You're doing it because you're eager. You want to help them. You love the Lord and you love them. You want to see them do well. And then now he, he shifts to the congregation. He says, a new congregation in the face of suffering and what you're going through, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. What is submission? I used to have struggle. What does it mean to submit anyway? It sounds like a, a derogatory term, but it's not. It's pretty easy to understand. Here's what submission is. Here's a picture. Here's what the leader says. They want to go the direction. Here's the direction I want to go. We don't agree. Submission is not agreement. Agreement is easy. You see it this way, I see it this way, we see it the same way, we go together. Submission is you see it this way, I don't see it that way, I see it a different way, but I'm going to submit, I'm going to come under what you want to do, even though I don't agree. And that's not easy. How many times do we see that? In the church in particular, I mean, why are we doing that? I think we should be doing that. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right, but... Here's what the leaders have decided in the church. The elders were going this way. I don't think that's right. Well, you could be right in the end. We'll see. But what are you, what are you to do? I'll submit. We all have to submit. The Bible says submit one to another. We all have to submit to somebody. We all submit to our government. Do I like all the laws we have? No. Do you like the laws on taxation? No. No. What does God require of us with our government? Pray for our leaders. Obey our leaders. Pay our leaders. Pay your taxes. I don't have to like it, but God wants me to submit. He wants there to be order, and God works through authority. He works through authority in a family. The husband is the leader of the family. So do it well, men. Your boss is a leader at work. Your coach is the leader of the team. Your elders are the leaders of the church. We all have to submit ourselves and humble ourselves even when we don't agree. Now, the one time you don't do that, if there's sin involved, you don't submit to sin, right? But the younger, submit yourselves to the, the, the spiritually mature people. All of you, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace, favor to the humble. James says it almost the same way. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Have you learned this about the kingdom of God? It works and operates by service and humility. Humility. What is humility? It's the complete opposite of pride and arrogance. The Bible says God keeps the proud at arm's length. And if you feel like you're in a place in your life where you're going through the same destructive pattern, cycle, you may just want to say this. Instead of continuing to do the same thing and have the same attitude you've had, suffering kind of in this pattern and not being able to understand why does this keep happening to me? Why does this? You may want to take a couple steps back and just reevaluate and say, am I in pride about this? Am I being arrogant? 
Am I being kind and humble? Or am I being proud and stubborn? Just step back and evaluate. If, if something in life feels like gears without grease, it's dry, it's hard, it could be you need more grace, the oil of God's grace, and that comes through humility. Where you take the low road, which is the high road. Whoever exalts himself will be abased. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's the way of the kingdom. It's the way of serving. It's the way of leadership. It's the way we're to live. Humble ourselves. Where we're, we're more concerned about the needs of others than our own. That takes maturity, but that's what attracts the grace of God. It, God lavishes grace on people who humble themselves. And now he says this. So there's this element of submission. There's this element of humility. And now he says this to the church. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time and cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. How comforting is that? God cares for you. What anxiety do you have right now? Do you have anxiety about your future? Do you have anxiety about your family? Do you have anxiety about your finances? Do you have anxiety about your marriage? Do you have anxiety? What do you have angst in? What's causing that turmoil in you? Take that very care, and we've said this many times, just like it says in Philippians, like it's, Peter says, turn those cares into prayers. Renew your mind in the word of God. Find a promise of God and stand on it. Do an evaluation of yourself. God, am I in obedience to you? Do I have a willing heart? God, I'm going to take this care and I'm going to turn it into a prayer and I'm going to trust that you're going to do what's best for me because you care for me. He careth for me. He careth for you. (laughs) Through sunshine and shadow, he cares for you. And you can take all those anxieties to the Lord. David said in Psalm, I think it was David, Psalm 94, 19, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. God gives us comfort, joy, even in the middle of that trial when we're trusting in him. And then in verse eight, be alert and of sober mind. Be alert, pay attention. Sometimes the attacks in your life are motivated by evil. There is evil in this world. You don't think so, just watch the news for about 20 minutes. And you're like, that's all the evil I could take for one day. There's murder and rape and jealousy and greed and mistreatment of people and human trafficking and war unjust. And I mean, just there's evil everywhere. We're called to be light in the middle of a dark place. We're called to be salt, to help people heal from their wounds. But guess what? Don't fall asleep on the job. Recognize you have an enemy. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How does Satan devour people? The temptation of evil, but here's the biggest thing that I've seen. It's through deception and people leaving their faith. So how do we resist Satan? You know, do you put your armor on like physical armor and grab your Bible and just start screaming? You can do that. It might be kind of funny to watch that. Resist him. How? Standing firm in the faith. I'm going to stand in the truth of God's word. I am going to do battle with the Bible. I'm going to get God's word in my mind. I'm going to get God's word in my heart. I'm going to get God's word in my mouth. Ephesians 6 talks about what we have. We have the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The only in the shield of faith. 
you quench the fiery darts of the enemy with the shield of faith, and then you do battle with the Bible. The word of God is your sword. Ephesians 6, if you want to read about it. I don't have time to talk about it now. But be alert. Resist Satan. Don't just succumb or give in to the, okay, sirrah, sirrah. Fight it. Fight the anxiety. Fight the temptation. Fight the falsehood. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing same kind of sufferings all through the world, through all time. Verse 10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Listen to this. After you have suffered a little while, will himself, God himself will restore you. God himself will make you strong. God himself will make you firm. God himself will make you steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever Amen. The God of grace knows when you're suffering, knows when you're in a valley, knows when you're full of anxiety and fear. And he tells you, you know, resist Satan, stand firm in the faith. Know that God cares for you. And God himself is going to restore you. Believe that. God himself will make you strong. God himself will have you stand firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a battle, in the middle of temptation. Put your faith, your trust in the Lord. Resist the evil standing firm in your faith, knowing that after we've suffered for a little while, God's going to restore us. God's going to make us strong. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not faint. They shall walk and not be weary. When you come through a battle and you see that God, your faith didn't fail in the trial and God has restored you and he's strengthened you. You see that your footing is solid. You're still firmly planted in your faith. You're steadfast. That should encourage you like nothing else. God's got me. And now we'll close with this. It's his farewell to all. He said, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you to briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Stand firm, stand fast in the grace, in your faith, in the truth. She who is in Babylon, talking about like a mystery way to say the church, she is the church, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Go ahead and do that. You can greet one another with a kiss of love. Maybe that was a cultural thing. But I love how he ends it. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Peace to you. Peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding. That peace on the inside. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, how come? Do you believe that God loves you in spite of you breaking the Ten Commandments, in spite of your sin? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he went to the cross to pay for your sins and mine in his own body on that tree? And have you put your trust in Jesus, the risen Lord? Peace to all who are in Christ. How do you get in Christ? It's by faith. It's putting your trust in him as Lord, as Savior. I want to lead you in a prayer right now to do that. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we can stand firm in the trial, in the middle of suffering, because you strengthen us. 
you never leave us nor forsake us. You care for us. And Father, there may be some here today and they've not, they're not found in Christ yet. They haven't put their faith in you. If that's you, friend, I encourage you to do it. Do what the scripture says, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead. Do you believe that? And if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. Let's just pray together and confess him as our Lord and be saved from sin, the penalty of sin, saved from hell, become part of the family of God. How does that happen? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we put our trust in you. We call on your powerful name. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us. Even when we were in sin, even when we were not looking for you, you came looking for us. Receive us now, Lord, by faith. We put our trust in you. We want to know you. Put your spirit inside of us. Help us to grow in our understanding of who you are and how we can bring you glory in this world. We ask this thing in the name of Jesus Christ, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen.